Okay, great. Thanks, Eric, for the, uh, uh, thank you. Um, colleagues in the media, thanks for allowing our team to share our perspectives today. Just a few opening thoughts. Um, uh, Thanksgiving is uh, coming up uh, this weekend, and uh, uh, obviously it's one of the highlights of the year. Um, families uh, have a chance to gather, um, and it's a time for reflection. Um, the pandemic has uh, clearly affected uh, the holiday season, um, and uh, just a few things we would suggest from the public health service. First, uh, dining events are high-risk events for the transmission of COVID-19. We have seen exposures uh, and cases of COVID related to uh, 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 dining events. We would ask uh, that the host of dining events be cognizant of the challenges related to the pandemic and to that extent um, uh, to try to limit the number of people outside of your immediate family or immediate household from attending a dining event. Um, uh, we would really encourage people uh, 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 to try to limit the number of people who are not vaccinated. So if you are having a dining event, you know, my recommendation and I think the public health service recommendation is if at all possible, make sure all the people attending are vaccinated. If they're eligible for vaccine, they should be vaccinated. And that helps uh, protect the people who are attending the event as well as help the person who might be coming to the event. So try to encourage vaccinated people to attend uh, or um, and uh, if at all possible, have uh, uh, the event outdoors if at all possible. We know that COVID is more likely to be transmitted indoors and outdoors. We know that wearing a mask is, is uh, at some level protective from uh, to minimize the spread. So those are some general remarks that we would have uh, as it relates to uh, the Thanksgiving uh, holiday season, which is coming, uh, which is upcoming this weekend. Um, so with that, uh, perhaps uh, Eric, we can take some, uh, we can go to uh, Ramsey's presentation. Yes, thank you. We'll throw it over to our manager of epidemiology and evaluation, uh, Ramsey D'Souza, for the epidemiological presentation for this week. Thank you, Eric. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining for this week's presentation. Uh, we'll jump straight into the main points of, of this week's summary. We will begin by talking once again about what's happening in Canada overall, um, diving into what's happening a little bit in, in Ontario, and rounding up with what we're seeing in Windsor-Essex. <coughs> in Canada, we are seeing our case counts decline, um, though they still remain high in, in some of the other regions. Um, moving on to Ontario, Ontario's numbers have slowly been decreasing. We seem to be we, so we compared to Ontario, I mean, to the rest of Canada, we have been doing relatively well. Our current 70 average for Ontario is 576 cases a day, whereas this time last week we were at 621 cases a day. So we are seeing a decrease in case count in the province. When we move into Windsor Essex, just like the province as well, we are seeing. Oops. We are seeing a decrease in our in our case counts here as well. Our current seven day average is 34.6 cases per day. This time last week we were at 40 cases per day. So just like Ontario, our numbers are declining as well. Now, how do we compare week over week? Last week we didn't see much of a change in, in our case rates uh, when we compared it to the, the week prior to that. This week, however, we are seeing a decrease. This week being week 39. Uh, our, our most completed week, our case rates are 56 cases per 100,000 100, population, whereas last week we were at 65.2 cases per 100,000 population. When we look at the most recent seven days, it's not, not, not looking at any kind of week to week comparisons, our most recent seven days, our case rates are 53.2 cases per 100,000 100, population, which is lower than the week prior to that at 62.5 cases. Even though our case rates are declining, they still remain higher than the province's rate for the most completed week and for the other areas of the southwest as well. This is a new slide that we added in for this week. It compares the 
the, the most recent completed week across all public health units in Ontario. Uh, so for the most completed week, it's from September 26th to October 2nd. And as you can tell, we have currently the fourth highest rate in the province, only being surpassed by Lambton, East Ontario, and Chatham-Kent. Our rates, though, is much higher than what we're seeing at the overall province-wide level. When we dive a little bit deeper and look at our wastewater surveillance data, we have noticed in the past four weeks overall that we were seeing decrease, and this coincided with what we're seeing in our in our case counts as well. Though in the first week of October, we we have seen an increase in in our wastewater levels, which has coincided with what we're seeing in the past few days with our case counts, where we're in the 40s once again. Looking at our, our percent positivity, for the week ending on October 2nd, our percent positivity was 3.5%. This has declined from the week prior, where we were at 4.3%. Now looking at the most recent seven days for our percent positivity, we're, we're in the top two, only being surpassed by East and Ontario. Our, our percent positivity um, for the most recent seven days is at 4.1%, slightly higher than what we're seeing for our most completed week. When we try and break down our percent positivity by age for the most recent seven days, uh, using a, a seven day average, overall our, our percent positivity has decreased in the region. And currently um, the highest percent positivity are among those 35 to 64 years of age. Whereas in the past four weeks or so, they were the highest among our younger age groups. When we look at our case rates for the month of October and the, and the last five to six days, um, the highest case rates are from the town of Essex, followed by Leamington, and then to come see at Windsor. When we look at the past 30 days in terms of how our cases are dis distributed across our region from September 6th to October 5th, over 57% of our cases are from Windsor. This number has been higher in the past, but we are seeing case counts in other areas too. For example, almost 10% of our cases are from Leamington, 8% from Lakeshore, and 7% and from, from LaSalle. This is, even, it, this is even higher when we look at the most recent seven days in the past, we were seeing about 60%, if not higher, from Windsor, um, but currently only 50% of our cases, just under 50% of our cases are from Windsor. 15% of our cases in the past seven days were from Essex and 12% from Leamington. When we compare our age and gender breakdowns, once again, uh, no surprise to what we're seeing in the past couple of weeks, um, the 0 to 19 age group still has um, the, a, a high burden of illness with, um, with our case counts, it's at 31%. And, and in, in comparison to the other age groups, it's much lower. When we look at how our cases are acquiring COVID-19 from September onwards, we see a mixed distribution, though we are seeing higher levels in uh, from household contacts and from the community where source of acquisition um, cannot be identified. When we quantify that, just under 34% of our cases are acquiring COVID from the community, whereas 32% are acquiring from the household contact. This graph focuses on our school-aged children. And though we are seeing an increase in our in our school age cases, it is still relatively high to what we're seeing in the past. Um, it's it's below levels than what we saw in the second wave, which was our most um, impactful wave during our during the pandemic locally. It's currently at levels at peak levels to what we're seeing in our mild third wave. Now comparing our seven day averages and school-aged children in the green line to our overall seven-day average, 
though they're both increasing, it is still um, higher in our, in our school age average when we look at the trends, which is once again reflected when we're seeing about 31% of the cases in, among those 0 to 19 years of age. Hospitalizations in, in Ontario and Windsor Axis is, is represented in this graph. Hospitalizations in Ontario have been on the general, have been on general unchanged from this time last week, whereas in Windsor Essex we are seeing a, a slight decrease this week. In Ontario, the ICU admissions have decreased for this past week. Uh, whereas in Windsor Essex it has fairly remained unchanged, though we are seeing some fluctuations week over week. Now, when we look at our doubling time again in Windsor Essex, our doubling time has decreased again, indicating signs of improvement. So, in this graph, the dark blue blue line is increasing, showing that it's taking longer for our cases to to double. The doubling time in Ontario has fluctuated, but has remained fairly unchanged, um, and and we see this in in terms of what's being um, um, uh, reported by the province, where they have about 400 cases a day at times to 600, and, and it drops down. So but the fluctuation is there, but it has fairly remained stable. When we look at Canada, the, the doubling time for Canada has remained low uh, because of what of the activity taking place across other provinces, though we, we are seeing signs of improvement now. For our most recent um, R, uh, estimated median R0, it stands at 0 0.96. This is slightly higher where we were at last week, but it's still well, uh, it's still it's still below one. When the R naught is below one, it means that every existing infection leads to less than one new infection. Changing gears a little bit when we move into our, our vaccine status. <laughs> when we look at uh, at the number of doses administered in in September onwards. The seven-day average as of October 5th for doses administered is 935. This time last week, we were, we were administering um, just over 1,100 doses a day. And, and, and so what, what this highlights is that we're seeing a decrease in doses administered locally in our region. This graph, this graph kind of puts it in, into more of a better perspective, looking at all of our doses, whether it's first, second, or third. And, and the seven day average. And we can see that in the most recent seven days, <clears throat> our numbers are, are slowly starting to decline and lag. When we look at our coverage rates <clears throat> across um, overall by, by age groups and by certain thresholds, if you're 18 plus or 12 plus, we're seeing that we are seeing improvements in our younger age groups. We are over 70% uh, among those 12 to 24 years of age for at least one dose. Um, there is still still work to do across across those age groups to, to bring that, that coverage rate for one dose higher. Our overall coverage rate for those who are eligible to get the vaccine uh, for at least one dose is just below 84%. Now moving on to fully vaccinated individuals, we do have some, some work to do here. Uh, we are once again seeing, seeing some improvements in our younger age groups, uh, but there's still a lot of work to do. We need to have have the coverage rates increase for those from 12 to 29 years of age, um, and even those in, in, the, in the 30s and 40s, to, to have a, a better coverage rate for our region. When we look at our vaccine coverage rates for our hotspots and overall, and this includes all of our residents in Windsor Essex, even those that are not eligible to receive the vaccine. Certain hotspots, for example, the N9A have a higher coverage rate, whereas historically we've, we have continued to see lower coverage rates in the N9A postal code. And this holds true once again when we look at our fully vaccinated coverage rates, just over 50% of those in the N9A postal code are, are fully vaccinated. So how do we compare ourselves to the rest of the province? We're still in the bottom end for our coverage rates for at least one dose. Um, and, and, and there's still, still some work to do there. Uh, we're also below the uh, provincial coverage rate average. 
And this holds true for our, our fully vaccinated individuals as well, where we're, we're once again in the bottom half of where we would like to be. Um, and there are there are improvements that, that can be made to 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 move to boost our coverage rates to uh, to a, a higher number. <clears throat> so in summary, our case rates in Windsor Essex has continued to decrease this past week. Our wastewater surveillance data indicates that there has been an increase this past week, though we have in general observed a decline for the month of September. We do, we continue to have cases in our younger age groups. Um, in comparison to the others, about 31% of our cases in the past two weeks have been in this population. The COVID-19 hospitalizations, um, though, have decreased, whereas ICU admissions in our region has remained unchanged. The, the number of doses that we've administered has has decreased, though, in this in this past week. So, looking at our monitoring indicators for our most completed week, our case rates are 56 cases per 100,000 population whereas in the most recent seven days, it's at 53.2 cases per 100,000 population. Our percent positivity is at 3.5%, and our most recent seven days percent positivity is at 4.1%. Um, our our R-naught is at 0 0.96, and outbreaks in our region continues to, to remain high. Today, we have reported about 25 um, outbreaks in our region, which is which continues to remain high and, and a trend to what we're seeing in, in the past month, month and a half. Our coverage rates for first dose is 83.7%, um, whereas fully vaccinated individuals, our coverage rates at 78.2% for those that are eligible. Thank you. Thank you, Ramsey. Um, we'll now take questions from the media, and we will start with CTV. Good morning. Um, looking at the EPI summary, do you feel comfortable that the region is heading in the right direction <clears throat> with the key indicators? Yeah, I think that, well, a couple of caveats. One is that uh, one has to think of this as an overall picture of the long game. I think overall, I think there are positive signals to suggest that there is uh, a better control of COVID uh, now than, than perhaps in previous weeks. It's also worth noting that uh, looking at the uh, burden of disease in Windsor-Essex compared to other health districts, that uh, Windsor-Essex still has a higher burden of COVID in the community than uh, in the um, uh, other uh, health districts uh, within the province. Uh, Ramsey, is that a fair characterization? That That's correct. I think that the key piece to also highlight is we are seeing improvements, but we would almost need to swap or be in a position where our case rates are on the lower end and our vaccination rates are on the higher end. I think that's that's the goal and the the area where we need to focus or, or move towards is to how do we, how can we increase our coverage rates and which will uh, indirectly directly impact our, our case rates. Okay, thank you. And you're releasing the recommendations for Thanksgiving. How confident are you that residents will follow the recommendations given that this is the second Thanksgiving that um, they are in or we are in a pandemic? Well, I, I think that uh, the people in the community uh, are committed to trying to control COVID-19. So I, I would anticipate that the vast majority of people will uh, consider uh, these recommendations as they move forward with their holiday uh, uh, planning. Um, I don't think anyone wants their holiday event uh, to be a source of an outbreak or the source of exposures and people getting sick. So I think that people will follow through uh, on the recommendations. They are challenging for sure. I think it's fair also to say that uh, um, uh, 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 P, uh, individuals and families and businesses are um, stressed and continue to be stressed by the, the nature of the COVID pandemic. Uh, no family has been unaffected and no business has been unaffected uh, and no school or institution has been unaffected by uh, COVID-19. So um, from my perspective, I think that the, vast, the people will heed the advice 
uh, and we're hopeful that we won't see uh, numerous exposures related to Thanksgiving events. And is it harder to enforce or regulate the Thanksgiving gatherings because they are typically in people's homes? Yeah, I think what we're promulgating are recommendations and, uh, and uh, mm -hmm. not directives. And, and uh, so um, there, it's not something that would have uh, any enforcement actions per se, as much as uh, that we want people to voluntarily um, uh, voluntarily consider our recommendations as they formulate their plan moving forward. We'll now take questions from CBC. Welcome, Peter. Any questions, Peter? Okay, we'll go to Windsor Star. Yes, good morning, Nicole. Good morning, Doctor. Uh, doctor, how pivotal is the behavior of residents this Thanksgiving in determining case rates to come? Well, it is consequential for sure. Um, um, you know, the Public Health Service can provide guidance and, and can provide an understanding of the data, but a lot of the measures to control COVID-19 require the uh, adherence, cooperation, and affirmation of people in the community. So to the extent that uh, people in the community uh, follow through on the guidance, I think that'll have an impact on the burden of COVID-19 and all the metrics that we might use to evaluate the burden of illness. So the uh, things such as case rates, the number of people who are currently self-isolating, the number of outbreaks, uh, the percentage of positivity of individuals, all of that uh, uh, is in some way related to the activities and uh, 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 conduct of the uh, individuals in the uh, in the community. The one other thing, and this I think is a very core message, is the level of public health restriction is modulated or is, uh, by the, the vaccination rates. We had a, uh, and I know this is the, a hard goal, but if we had 99% vaccination rate, then the level of uh, public health interventions could be uh, uh, less assertive. Uh, but right now in Windsor, Essex, we have lower vaccination rates than the vast majority of health districts within the province and the burden of disease in, uh, in Windsor, Essex is higher than uh, uh, most of the health districts uh, in the province. Thank you. AM 800. Ramsey, just going back to uh, your summary there for the number of doses, uh, uh, like you mentioned the past seven days, we've seen a decrease. I'm not sure if I missed that slide. How many uh, doses were administered the past seven days compared to the previous week? In the past seven days, we were administering about 940 doses a day, whereas the week prior to that, we were, we were doing about 1,100 doses a day. And I'm not sure if you have this number available. And I know Nicole uh, mentioned it before, how there's some individuals that have one dose but haven't got the second dose. Do we know what that number is like in Windsor-Essex right now? How many people that have received the first dose still haven't got their second dose? It currently sits at about 20,000. The the exact number um, is 20,826. Sorry, more questions about uh, the vaccine rates and doses. Uh, a couple of weeks back, I think it was just under 70,000 uh, people that in our area that were still unvaccinated. Has I know the percentages have not really gone up. Are we still looking in that ballpark, or has it gone down? Uh, I guess by thousand, thousands, hundreds. The, so, so in terms of the number of people, uh, we're currently about sixty thousand people who are un unvaccinated. We've we have administered at least one dose to about ten thousand from the initial seventy thousand uh, ballpark figure we had released a couple of weeks ago. Um, so, so we are making progress. It is it is slow, but we are seeing improvements. We have seen improvements in our younger age groups, uh, which which we were concerned about initially. But you know, we are seeing at least one dose in our. Um, those 12 to 17 and 18 to 24 were where we're now at over 70 percent so there are signs of improvement but um but there's still uh much more improvement for us or opportunities for us to improve in, in that area nicole i know uh, my colleagues asked you this question before but uh, in regards to the pop-up clinics i know there's some plan for uh, i believe today tomorrow and this weekend are you 
the health unit, health officials seeing the crowds at these pop-up clinics, or um, is it disappointing that pe more people are not coming out to these pop-up clinics? Um, we're not seeing very large numbers um, with our pop-up clinics or our mobile clinics um, really at all. Um, I, you know, I won't say disappointing. Um, certainly, we would love to see, uh, you know, about 60,000 people show up between our um, our pop-up clinics and our mobile clinics and our mass vaccination clinics. Um, they are very small numbers. We're a little bit more of a crawl with our pop-up and mobile. But I've, as I've said before, you know, we see every dose first or second dose as a real success. And, our, you know, our goal at least um, is to ensure physical access. Um, so we'll continue to work with our partners um, to make those uh, pop-up and mobile clinics available. We know they are, um, you know, some some individuals would, you know, prefer that over a mass site or, you know, a pharmacy location or, or a primary care. Uh, it's more locally driven. Um, so we'll continue to do that. We are modifying our plans a little bit. Um, it is very resource intensive to be out in so many places. Um, and so just in the coming months, we will, um, you know, modify our resources, but we will still make uh, mobile clinics available where possible. And sorry, one more, I'm guessing this might be for either any, any of you, but with that number, the individuals that have one dose and they're still waiting to get their second dose, any reasons why you think? Is it what they're reading, what they're hearing, they just don't have time? Uh, any guesses there? So. I'll start, and, and certainly um, uh, Ramsey or, or Dr. Nesathiri can add. Um, so there's, I would guess there's a number, and Ramsey will know the number, but I mean, there's a number of those folks that may have, uh, as we said, there were about 10,000 people that have gotten their you know, first dose uh, from the last time maybe we reported numbers of unvaccinated. So certainly there's probably a great number of individuals that are are not yet at that point where they're eligible for their second dose. So there's that. What we have heard um, historically, we did uh, do some surveys and and um, reach out to the community um, with our partners. And um, we did active calling. I know we reported that before where we were actively calling individuals that were eligible for their second dose, um, had their first dose were eligible for their second dose and, and hadn't yet um, made it. And what we heard was time um, people were busy. Um, they just didn't have time to get around to it. Um, we had heard, um, you know, some comments around, um, you know, maybe people, um, you know, had some soreness after in their arm and some of the typical things we would hear from vaccine and, and we're maybe a little less sure. So, um, you know, we take our team takes time to um, talk about those things and coach folks through. Um, but I would say the predominant was uh, really it was a, the priority piece, the lack of time. Thank you. Any additional questions from CTB? Yes, I'm just looking for an update on the meeting with the school board um, about ex extracurriculars. Was anything in particular decided or how did that go? Well, the um, uh, the the recommendation of the uh, uh, there was a, there continues to be dialogue between the uh, the public health service and the school board officials. Uh, we both share the common goal of trying to minimize transmission of COVID-19 at schools and uh, concurrently uh, 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 trying to keep schools open for instruction. Um, the, the consensus was that uh, we will uh, recommend that uh, extracurricular activities uh, can be reinstituted for participants who are fully vaccinated. Uh, and we're asking the school boards uh, and the school officials to formulate a policy so they can effectuate that. And once they formulate a policy to effectuate uh, 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 allowing um, uh, individuals who are fully vaccinated to participate in extracurricular activities, uh, the the pause can be ended and uh, extracurricular activities can be reinstituted for that population of patient, of uh, students. Okay, thank you. Um, is, so is there a timeline for that? So um, we haven't put a specific timeline. Um, we've provided our, as uh, Dr. Nesazari said, we've provided our recommendations about um, what we believe uh, would be a, a appropriate reintroduction um, for those who are fully vaccinated. And so the timeline really at this point is is dependent um, 
and can vary, it could vary um, certainly by school board. Um, you know, they'll have to uh, do some work to obviously put in place a procedure or process um, to ensure uh, that those who are participating are fully vaccinated. And is it discouraging to see um, students protesting the postponement when you are trying to do it in their best interest? Well, uh, go ahead. Uh, I'm ha I'm happy to start. You know, um, the first part of it, uh, 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 the first part of education is is uh, uh, or a key part of education is uh, for young people to articulate their perspectives and to try to make decisions for themselves. And to the extent that uh, 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 that uh, young people uh, try to understand the issues and uh, and try to articulate their beliefs and uh, uh, um, uh, articulate their disagreements in a civil manner. I uh, I think that's okay. I think that's actually a good part of instruction and education. Um, it, it's not uh, you know as a parent, it's not unusual for uh, uh, it's entirely anticipated actually that. Uh, young people might have a different perspective than uh, uh, others and people perhaps in authority positions or uh, in public uh, positions. So I'm not discouraged by the fact that young people choose to articulate their perspectives and, uh, uh, um, uh, and as part of living in any, uh, uh, any democracy, someone's got to make the decisions based on some framework. So uh, I don't believe that's, uh, 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 I don't believe that's a concern to me. I think the most important thing, though, is, is at the end of the day, if we want to try to get out of the pandemic or try to have better, uh, less public health restrictions, we have to work to improve our vaccination rates. And to the extent that schools are at the current time an area of, of exposure and transmission, recognizing that we've had more than 200 school class cohorts dismissed, it's really important that we have this dialogue about getting as many people vaccinated as possible. Okay, thank you. Anything from CBC? Windsor Star? Yes, just one more. Is the threshold for a class cohort dismissal in terms of exposure the same this school year as it was last school year, or have considerations changed with the introduction of the Delta variant and other variables? Um, so the dismissal process is is relatively unchanged um, this year from last year. So uh, students in a class cohort are um, what we call a cohort in a classroom. Um, you know, they're all considered high risk contact when there's an exposure uh, within the classroom. And uh, that was the same same uh, as last year. Okay, so when we're comparing the 200 plus courts dismissed so far this year to the about 50 last year, you are comparing apples to apples. Yeah, as far as our process for dismissals go, yes, it, it, it's the same. Okay, thank you. AM 800. Doctor, sorry, going back to Melanie's question about extracurricular activities. So I just want to make sure I have it right. So the pause remains. The health unit told the school boards to come up with a plan uh, to for fully vaccinated students. At that time, the health unit will look at those plans and determine if the pause will be lifted. Uh, if I can just clarify. Um... Yeah, the, I mean that the pause will re basically we're recommended that it's delayed until they have a process in place to ensure that um, those that are participating are fully vaccinated. Um, as far as the level of review, certainly we'd be in discussion with them to ensure that they're that you know that they're saying they have a process, but um, it's not like a you know approval per se. If unless you know, Dr. Nister, I don't know if you have anything to add. Yeah, so uh, first of all, uh, anytime we work in a collaborative nature, there's back and forth and there's some level of discussion and dialogue. And uh, uh, there are times, uh, and in this particular instance, we continue to talk with school board officials on a regular basis. So uh, the other point I'd share is, is that we're, we made this recommendation to the school board and uh, our recommendation is, is that the, the, the currently there's a pause 
uh, we've asked the school board uh, uh, to formulate a policy, and that policy's uh, key uh, requirement or key recommendation is that only people who are fully vaccinated participate in extracurricular activities. And once the school, the, uh, school board has uh, prepared that policy, they can move forward with uh, um, uh, reinstituting extracurricular activities for fully vaccinated individuals. We don't necessarily have to have a review of the policy before it goes forth, but uh, the health district obviously will provide its, uh, its uh, guidance and insight so that policy can be reasonably effectuated. I hope that answers your question. Yes, it does. And sorry, one more point. Are you hoping that the policy is the same for all our school boards in Windsor-Essex, or do you think there will be different policies for each board? Um, I, you know, policies are policies or procedures or processes I would expect would be different. Um, I think the essence of it will be the same as long as it, as Dr. Nisithuri said, it uh, effectuates that, you know, all of those participants are fully vaccinated. But I, I think, you know, the policy or procedure process will likely be different for each board, um, given their different institutions and they have, you know, different sort of, you know, different operations. Thank you. Happy Thanksgiving. Thank you. Okay, that is the end of our questions. Thank you very much, everybody, for attending today. Our next uh, morning media conference will be on Wednesday, October 13th. Thank you, right. and happy Thanksgiving to you all. All right. All the best. Thank you. Happy Thanksgiving. Thank you. Bye-bye. Happy Thanksgiving. You.